Welcome everybody to Miami, or actually you're in Miami, I'm in Philadelphia. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I thank Marty for this opportunity to get on. Ed, great presentation, really enjoyed listening to it. a lot of thought provoking ideas in there. Um, and I'm very excited about this Ivy Fund. And, and Marty, thank you for making us the kickoff panel. I, I know over the next couple of days, you're gonna have like 400 families involved in this and they're gonna be uh, RAAs, broker dealers, private companies, CEO, fund managers. It's always a great event. Uh, today, our panel, we're speaking on manager selection and we have a great group for, for this discussion, including Chip Perkins. Uh, Chip, who has raised over $8 billion for, for managers over the last 25 years. And Jim Olses, who is, has over a decade of experience uh, in the family office space, including his current undertaking as CIO for Fire Capital Management. Uh, if you looked at the uh, online and the online agenda, you would have seen Brad Halliburton, CIO for Tradition Investment Management was also listed there, but uh, Brad was unable to join us today. So it's just gonna be the two of us. And I think the real benefit of that is we get a chance to really probe into their minds and really get to understand their processes and how they work and how they see the world. And I think it makes for a, a deeper, better conversation for us. Uh, so now I've just scared Jim and, and, and Chip out there. <laughs> um, before we jump into, discussion, into our discussion, let me just take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Mark Heil. I'm the Institutional Sales Manager for Pacific Premier Trust a division of Pacific Premier Bank, formerly known as Pensco. For those of you who are not familiar with Pacific Premier Trust, we are one of the largest and most experienced non-fiduciary custodians that focuses on the custody of alternative assets. Uh, our custody solutions include self-directed IRAs, private fund custody, custody of private retirement funds, broker dealers, successor custodian services, ESOPs, uh, so on down the line. Uh, we work a lot with family offices, RIAs, broker dealers, asset sponsors, defined benefit plans, investment platforms, ESOPs. And whenever you work for the bank, there is a mandatory disclosure. So I have to read that to cover my backside. Otherwise, compliance would be all over me. Uh, and that, that disclosure is simply information presented here is for the educational purposes only and is intended and is and is not intended and may not be relied upon as tax, legal, investment, or other advice. Pacific Premier Trust performs the duties of a custodian and as such does not evaluate, recommend, or endorse any particular investment opportunities. You are advised to consult your professional advisor for specific, gar for specific guidance regarding your investment. Investments are not FDIC insured and are subject to risk, including the loss of principal. Now that I've gotten that out of my way, thank you for that. Uh, those of you who have seen me moderate these panels before, you know I like an interactive discussion. I like it with my panelists. I also like it with the audience. So if you have a question or you want to get it out there and you're at the event in Miami, simply get the, the attention of one of our panelists, get Chip's or, or Jim's attention. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, then as they like to say, they smash that chat button and fire away with your question. Just put it right in there. I'll say it. We'll, we'll certainly pick it up and we'll, we'll get it answered. I'd like to do that in real time. So as soon as you post it, you can expect an answer in a couple of minutes. Uh, there's a finite, finite amount of time. So this is not a time to make a speech if you're asking a question. Get to the point, ask your question, and we will give you the response. Um, I already gave high level introductions for our panelists, but what I'd like to do right now is just have them talk for a minute or so about themselves, their firms, and give you a little background. And Chip, why don't you kick us off? Okay, just one second, Chip. Mark, no, no, no. I just want to make sure you can hear Chip okay. So when Chip starts speaking, you can, because you know, we have this funky microphone system here. So Chip. Morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. This I can hear him just fine. One of my first uh, in-person events uh, in seems like a long time. Uh, my firm is Perkins Fund Marketing. Obviously, I'm very in-depth at coming up with ideas because my last name is Perkins. Um, I'm a broker-dealer, 
have been for uh, 25 years. Uh, all my team is registered. We're overseen by FINRA and the SEC and the MSRB and a couple other people in Canada. It's very exciting because uh, everybody wants a piece of you these days. Uh, we have been in business, as uh, Mark said, for 25 years uh, doing the same thing. Hedge funds, a little bit of private equity, uh, some direct deals, but not many. Uh, we usually take on five or six hedge funds at any given time uh, and take those out to institutional investors and family offices uh, to provide uh, a great opportunity for investment. Uh, I'll be around all day if you have questions or uh, want to discuss things. Uh, if we do a good job, I have no disclosure. I will just use Mark's disclosure to be read for five minutes. Uh, and uh, just put the curtains on it, okay? Hey, Chip, you'll be glad to know that was the short version of it, too. Yeah, I know. Good <laughs> morning, you know, the exposure. Uh, as Mark said, thank you. My name is Jim Alset, uh, Chief Investment Officer for Fire Capital Management. You want me to speak up? Speak up. Um, yeah, we're, we're gonna, you guys have to speak up. So what's happening is that the microphone system is not projected on the TV. It, it records everything you say. And it shows on Zoom, but it doesn't project out to the audience because gotcha. uh, there's a delay issue. If you spoke on Zoom, it would take them out of the TV five seconds later. So. Got it. Uh, Chief Investment Officer for Fire Capital Management. We're a boutique investment management firm and multifamily office with nearly $1 billion in assets. Uh, we can't hear you. A global client base uh, served from principally from here in Miami, as well as the Bay Area, California. Uh, as I said, one billion in assets. Um, we, uh, our mission is to empower our clients to not only accomplish their investment goals, but also their philanthropic and, and legacy objectives as well. Um, prior to this, uh, with Fire Capital Management, I was the Deputy Chief Investment Officer for a large multifamily office here in Miami, We Family Offices. And glad to be here with you today. Well, terrific. And thank you for those introductions. Uh, Jim, maybe you could tell us about a recent manager that you've invested in. How did you meet the manager? What attracted you to the manager? What made you think the manager could, could be successful for you? Sure. Um, you know, not to name names, but, but something recent that we've invested in this past year that's had uh, remarkable success early on is uh, Apex Partners. They're a global private equity firm uh, focused more on technology and growth, but, but doing leverage buyouts principally uh, in the upper middle market. Uh, they raised a rather large fund, which is not necessarily our preference. We, we like people to not necessarily be forced to deploy capital in a, in a committed you know, fundraise, but be more selective. But they've shown over 30 years to this point of demonstrable outsized returns in, in that space and, and a uh, really large and sophisticated team with operators as, as well as you know, sophisticated and experienced deal uh, personnel. And ultimately, early on, they're about two thirds raised in less than a year, which is much faster than expected, but yet, and it's early on, but net marks are above 60% IRRs with nearly a three times multiple already with, with some exits already on the book. So really uh, strong returns early on. We'll kind of see how that goes, but they're also raising uh, early next year. Um, how did we meet them? Well, uh, as a multifamily office with, with considerable assets under management, often um, you meet them in, in things like this and, and working with, with people that are in our audience and I'm sure online, but, but ultimately in this particular instance, they reached out to us because of some, uh, you know, network relationships that we've maintained through time. And ultimately, as, as I mentioned, kind of the characteristics about, you know, their group and, and how they do things in the space that they're in, we're looking for a, what I would call a sustainable competitive advantage uh, in, in their space. That means that they understand the market opportunity, their philosophy aligns with how they might exploit any mispricing, anything where alpha might be generative as opposed to just simply taking a, a more systematic beta exposure, if you will, um, and that they have a demonstrable um, process in place where they can uh, identify and exploit, but do it repeatedly through time with those um, you know, resources that they've put into their process to uh, to to manage the portfolio and ultimately deliver outsized returns. Fantastic. Chip, I'm going to throw the same question at you. Just the, obviously you don't invest in them, but you have to, take the, to make the decision to want to market them to investors. 
So talk, us, talk to us about a recent manager that you've taken on and um, what you look for, how you met them, and give us a little background. Okay. Um, when he says we don't invest, we do occasionally invest. If we have capital, they've had a good year, we sometimes we'll leave it with them. Um, but we look at each one as if we're going to invest. And I ask all of my team, they all vote on whether we take somebody on or not. I've got to have a unanimous consent on that. And I ask, the last question I ask is, if you have the capital, would you invest with this manager? If they say, mm, no, it's not a manager to take on because if they wouldn't invest, how are they going to convince you to invest, right? Uh, so uh, probably one of the uh, most interesting ones I have uh, that we took on recently uh, is Northern Wright Capital, NRC, out of Darien, Connecticut. They're a small to mid cap, cap manager uh, with deep research. Um, and uh, Northern Wright had Matt, uh, the, the CIO, uh, had four years with a previous partner, uh, broke off. Uh, his partner didn't want to do it anymore and has had the last five years. He's annualized at about 13.5%. Uh, primarily, as I said, small and mid cap uh, US equities. Some uh, board seats are taken, uh, some uh, Canadian stocks, and occasionally a European stock that's in their wheelhouse. They have about $350 million, uh, and they also do separately managed accounts. Um, we took them on because we liked the record. Uh, at the time, I was also in Connecticut, uh, so it was uh, a little easier uh, to get to see them when we first started. Uh, I've subsequently moved my business to Palm Beach Gardens, but we talk on Zoom like everybody else now. Uh, they are uh, a full team of eight people. Uh, we like the way they invest. We like uh, the track record. Uh, we like their service uh, groups, their primes, et cetera. And we look at all aspects of that when we put the on a manager. In addition to that, we do background checks on the principals and the top people. Um, and uh, kind of look at everything we possibly can uh, under the rug, around the corner, skeletons in the closet. Hopefully, there aren't any. Um, and uh, we're very excited about this particular manager. So, fantastic. Was there anything in, in that relationship that, that you found? I know you said they had a strong track record, but there are a lot of managers out there who have strong track records at $350 million. And was there something that, that just sort of ticked with your team that said, yeah, we think these guys can be successful. We think our investor base is going to be really excited to meet these guys. Um, I like the way you had it set up. Uh, I like the, or I like the COO, uh, Right after we signed, of course, he brought in a uh, uh, inside marketer to work alongside us. And that can both, both be positive and negative. In this case, uh, it's a positive. Uh, Bob Anderson's a very smart young man and uh, is helpful in the process. Um, and we just hit it off. You know, we met during uh, last last uh, spring during the pandemic so again i talked about our first my first conference that was my first face-to-face -face meeting in about five months uh and uh you know it was, i was drawn by their intelligence and their process and they must have showed well over zoom well they show well over zoom now uh, <laughs> a little uh, coaching up from the sidelines there very good yeah. So. so anyway, from 2010 to 2020, you know, the market was characterized by low volatility, steady growth, low inflation, low interest rates. Since then, things have changed a little. We have a pandemic, change of administrations within the U.S., supply chain issues, oil and gas prices. And the one thing that is certain is that the future is not going to look like our recent past. So the question is, you know, as in you know, uh, Chip, in your case, somebody who's looking to take out managers and, 
and Jim, in your case, to investment managers, although I'll give the caveat, sometimes chips and vests. Um, what do you think are, are questions or, or, or new questions or things that are evolving that maybe fund managers are going to be asked today that they weren't asked two or three years ago? Well, honestly, I don't think people are, have, have flushed those questions from two or three years ago. I think that they're still in everybody's minds. I think uh, new questions are, you know, if your team is working remote, how are you doing that? How are you handling that? How's the interaction? Are you able to get the same kind of, you know, chat around the, you know, the end of the desk using Zoom and conference calls versus uh, yelling down the hall and saying, you know, Susie, get down here. I got to talk to you about, you know, X stock or X bond. Um, so that's different. Uh, I think, you know, the vaccine has, has allowed people to be more comfortable uh, coming back to the office, maybe a couple days a week, maybe not every day. Um, and I think people are curious, how are you, how are you running your business uh, in this new environment, this new world? Yeah, no, I'll add to that. And, and you know, I, I think Chip alluded to something and, and so did you, Mark, where they looked good via Zoom, right? Where we're normally, and I'm sure this was the case for you when you're looking under the rug and around the corner, you're doing operational diligence and usually that includes an on-site visit. During the pandemic, that's become increasingly more complicated to do. And so you've had to rely more on Zoom and meeting personnel remotely and not necessarily knocking on the door. Uh, but, you know, March of, of 2020 and, and, and that subsequent time period and ever since, while all the questions haven't necessarily been fleshed out, it provided a really interesting uh, case study as to exactly how those managers responded. Did they increase uh, communications? Was transparency there to the level that you needed? Were they available when you wanted to ask them how they were managing the portfolio in response to that? Did their strategy hold up, right? Like we talk about competitive advantage. Were they able to stick to their knittings and work their way through it? Were there other, um, you know, more inherent, implicit types of things, uh, e uh, leverage, explicit or implicit? Did that inhibit their ability to uh, to hold the course and ultimately produce the types of returns that you expected them to do throughout? So I think that we're seeing that, um, you know, sort of play out. Uh, and the, you know, the, the jury's not out yet, but as recently as Friday, we got another taste of how the market might, in fact, react to other variants as as we continue to. Kind of move through the the, the, the pandemic so uh we're, we still don't know necessarily but we're we're learning on the fly okay go add, on chip um that a lot of people are uh investing and following up with managers they knew prior to the pandemic um which is horrible for my business just go on <laughs> Uh, my guys look good on the zone if anybody's interested. Um, but, uh, you know, that's made it a little bit easier for their existing funds to get uh, more capital. And because you guys have already met with them potentially, or should have met with them before you invested them uh, prior to the pandemic. And I think now, uh, newer, younger, emerging managers and uh, people out looking for capital uh, have to fight to get face-to-face uh, -face or they either have to get better at being Zoom. And that's one of the things we try and do with our managers is coach them a little bit uh, to, to say, not to say the right thing, but say what they want to say in a way that's effective uh, over a television set. Um, Kind of like John Kennedy did back in the 60s when he got elected. Uh, but uh, I think it's a, a brave new world of technology. Uh, I think that uh, you as investors have to accept some things. Like, I mean, I have a manager in, uh, in China, great organization. I was lucky enough to meet them uh, in New York on a visit prior to the pandemic. But I've not yet been able to go to China to uh, do an on-site visit at their location, either in Hong Kong or Shanghai, which ordinarily I would have done within the first month 
Uh, and uh, my wife's not that interested in my flying off to uh, to China with, uh, you know, I won't go to Wuhan, I promised her, but you know, who knows? Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's very much a changed world and we all have to work at it. And I would love to hear from anybody if you've got any suggestions on how you've been able to do due diligence. Or let me just see quick hands. How many of you have done due diligence on a new manager and invested in a new manager over the last 16 months? And how have you done that? Yep. He's physically decided to leave Australia to relocate in Cambridge. I'm sure at the order of the Deputy Magistrate because I'm based in the Canada. The order of the Deputy Magistrate will get invested. He's had to literally pick up and move in order to get to the next stage. Yeah. A lot more stability. Yeah. Yeah, it's an evolving. Absolutely. It's definitely an evolving world. Um, Capital is fairly fungible, and apparently, you know, people are definitely flowing to where they need to do the to, freedom day. Could you do me a favor for the online audience and just repeat what she said and summarize it? I asked, the, well, she can do that. Uh, but what we were basically just saying that there's much more due diligence going on uh, and more background checks. Uh, and uh, you know, probably more time spent. Like if you ordinarily would go and spend a day or two days at a place, you know, you might be spending now, uh, you know, three or four days on Zoom uh, to get people in and out and uh, asking more questions versus just having a handshake and a and a brief conversation. So def definitely slower, more if if not the same sorts of uh, boxes that you're that you're checking and, and looking into um, on the soft side, like you said, looking into someone's background um, with the you know amount of capital that's out there chasing deals and as quickly as deals are getting done at, at these valuations, um, you know, not not to, to forecast this, but it's ripe for for fraud and you can't completely eliminate it, but you can mitigate it quite considerably by by being diligent in, in your pursuit of understanding what they're doing and how they're doing it, uh, and that you're dealing with people that with whom you want to do business with, and you look for things like alignment of interest or is, is usually very critical that they've got skin in the game as well. So those sorts of things generally lead to positive outcomes. Also, we're finding uh, uh, that if you use, you know, they, they give you references, right? They have to give you references, investor references, professional references, things like that. And I don't know about you, but if I've ever given a reference, it's usually somebody who's going to give me a decent reference, right? It's not going to be somebody who hates me. Uh, so what we're doing is spending a little more time uh, digging into places like LinkedIn uh, and uh, seeing who do we know that knows that person. Uh, and then calling them and say, hey, what do you think? Uh, so kind of trying to widen our net more, yeah. uh, not just take uh, what they hand to us, so. And Mark, I think we had a question back yeah. here. Just... Yeah, I just wanted to the comment. I think we've done quite a few uh, investments. And I guess the way that we managed to do it, maybe two things. Number one, we spent a lot more time speaking to fellow family officers that's been something that uh, perhaps we can spend quite some time more by talking more about the soft issues. And then also, we decided sometimes rather than having a, a larger check size that we gave on the form, we scaled back. So we just want to play close to just make the decision that we'll be on the other hand, now that we haven't done as much as we've done before. That makes sense. Did that come through, Mark? It did not. I, I'm going to need you and Chip to re repeat yeah. what they, they sort of summarize what they say. 
just to summarize, there's some great comments about uh, leveraging the network with other family offices, uh, much like Chip was saying, just do your diligence outside of just necessarily the reference checks that the manager might provide, uh, but then also perhaps scale back and kind of uh, dip your toe before making a full allocation without, you know, in, in the current dynamic. Fantastic comment. Just to sort of move us on and sort of on the same thing here. So given this new investment environment, you know, what strategies do you think are going to be more popular going forward? So hedge fund, venture, private equity, real estate, debt, secondary, special situations, or, or crypto, uh, DeFi? I, I don't want to say all of the above, and, and certainly I'd like to hear Chip's comments on kind of where he sees the you know the hot hot money flowing into these things. But it's we're hot money. Hot money. Sorry, we're, we're increasingly looking for um, less correlated things. So definitely alternatives usually run in a hedge fund type of format, evergreen, but with you know probably considerable lockups to manage liquidity. Could also be in a private equity capital drawdown type of structure. But things like um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, investing in in legal outcomes, things like that. Um, so stuff that's less correlated with the dynamics of of the market right now. As 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 we heard Yardini talk about, we're seeing a divergence in monetary and fiscal policies, and you know volatility, as as you mentioned, Mark, is is elevated from years past, right? And certainly in the face of uh, you know what might look like uh, more of a stagflation environment, we'll kind of see how that that plays out. But uh, increasingly looking for things that are less correlated with um, with, with current markets? Um, I would add uh, certainly less correlated, also real assets. Uh, people are uh, liking things, you know, if you kick it, it will hurt your toe. Uh, crypto, people are trying to figure it out. Uh, some people have uh, jumped in and have been rewarded. Uh, something we're trying to figure out if there's a crypto fund out there that, that we should represent carbon esg healthcare uh all of these things some of them are, are, are buzzwords but others are uh really important assets that people want to get into uh, diversity as well more in the institutional investors than the family offices uh because the family office doesn't have pension fund or something that has a requirement for diversity. Uh, but we're finding that that with our institutional investors uh, is also interesting. Um, but, you know, it's not like you have a long, short manager that's out there. You got to be doing something different. It's not like uh, it's a new asset class. Um, structured credit, uh, there's still a lot of interest in structured credit private credit um that answer your question you're not alan what happened to yeah, uh, i'm going to add add to that mark and you know you mentioned rightfully so that uh, often institutions uh, pension funds and the like have a mandate for esg and so on we're also finding however while mm -hmm. not a mandate uh fam our family office clients often have you know some value proposition something that's near and dear to them they're often philanthropic in their own right and so we're blending uh, that approach and whatever their impact goals are with their market seeking returns to make sure that uh, we're taking a holistic approach that they achieve achieve all of the the objectives that, that they would like to and that uh, ultimately that their capital is deployed in a way that they feel good about at the end of the day. It's interesting and I, I just wanted to ask you real quickly and we'll get to the question out in the audience. Um, but Jim, you know, specifically to, to you, uh, the philanthropic seems to be driving a lot of investment decisions, particularly among family offices. Um, and, you know, recently what I've seen it are some more trusts being formed. For instance, I recently did a, a charitable remainder trust where the person can control the, the investments. But at the end of the day, all the proceeds go to go to the uh, charity that he designates when, the, when it finally winds down or, you know, it comes to an end. Or, or he dies or whatever the outcome is. Are you, are you getting more demand for that from, from your clients? Absolutely, you know, and, and you, know, you didn't mention there, but there are certain tax advantages with doing things like that. We're also fre frequently setting up 
uh, donor advised funds and, and foundations uh, in their own right to make sure that uh, you know, we're, we're allocating in a way that uh, where they have control and, and ultimately to the extent that they want to give it away that they're doing it thoughtfully and in, and in context of their entire portfolio and, and achieving uh, you know, the total amount of income impact that they possibly can. But that is absolutely uh, increasingly something that we're fielding questions on. Fantastic. Why don't you go out to the audience? Oh, yeah. You had a question. Yes. What, to what extent does venture capital um, feature in your offerings or your choices? Uh, the, the question was, to what extent does venture capital, uh, you know, is on our on our plate? If uh, if we find a, a good guy, uh, you know, it's really hard to take a brand new venture capital fund and bring it out to the market. And that's usually uh, what we're presented with. So for us to take somebody out, they've got to have an unbelievable pedigree. Uh, they've got to have a team put together and they got to come up with 20 or 25% of the initial capital so that we can then, you know, take them out to people and say, oh, they're real. Um, so for us, uh, it's a more difficult uh, launch way to launch a, a fund and usually if you are a uh, existing venture capitalist and you're on your second or third fund uh, there's they hardly ever will hire a placement agent because they've got established if they've done well <laughs> if they haven't done well they'll call me right away uh, but uh, if they've done well they've got an established group of investors uh, that are uh, you know, ready, willing, willing, and able to you know, re-up with them. Uh, so it's not the case. Uh, there are some placement agents that spend all their time in private equity and venture capital. Uh, I have uh, been a guy that uh, <coughs> believes in doing what you do best. And what we've done best is hedge funds and similar kind of vehicles like that. So I don't do as much of of venture out of the billions we've raised, it's maybe 250 in private equity or venture. So, hey, Jim, your focus is on, uh, on liquid or more liquid investments. Than more equity. liquid. I do have some that are, are kind of hybrids that maybe have a five year lockup instead of a or a three year lockup instead of uh, a 10 or 12 year locker lockup. What if somebody had a, like a more liquid private equity investment <coughs> approach? Well, define liquidity. Uh, one second here. Uh, maybe if I can have Randy call it. Did you, Randy, give an answer to that? A liquid, how do you define a liquid private equity investment? Well, yeah, I'll be talking about it later today. Um, for me, liquid private equity means something that delivers the return pattern of private equity, which is to say, above market returns. Modest correlation with stocks and bonds, so if the market crashes, it doesn't go down too much. But we're in liquid security, so we can take money out of the time. So you're saying pipes or things like that? Uh, I would say those are not going to give me that, <coughs> that the um, excuse me, return pattern because what with pipes, once you're in that public stock, if the market crashes, it's going to go down all the way. So in my opinion, the only way to get the is to be in publicly traded companies and then also have some kind of edge on because if you don't edge, then it's not going to give those private equity performance back. People do have things that they call private equity reputation or what have you, uh, but don't use, use an edge. Um, but I think people will find that frustrating when you crash this company. Why would, how is that different from a good hedge fund manager that has a long, short portfolio? Right. Well, so the difference with a long short portfolio is you're unlikely to capture the upside of the market because obviously you're short now if the person has tremendous alpha, it may be possible for them to deliver those you know, much more return. But you know, we've seen with the hedge fund indexes have done, they haven't been remotely close to the market. So, you know, I, I mean, as I said, this is an area I have a lot of thoughts about. I've been researching this for 20 years. And, and in my opinion, what we have to do is first identify the kinds of companies. The private equity holds private companies, of course, find the comparable set of public companies to those who are holding the same stock. They need to lever it, <coughs> replicating LBO, so you can lever the same amount. Then you need to hedge the downside. So there's a lot of money to have to do there. 
to the middle of the day. And Randy, we're, we're not going to go through your whole presentation right now, but you, know, <laughs> you get the gist. We are, we are fine. Actually, there is a company in, in New York City that has a very liquid VC approach where they only invest in Series B, C, and D, uh, or Series A, but they expect the uh, liquidity event within you know, uh, 16 to 36 months. But still, yeah. there's still 36 months left. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's fascinating. It, it, it's very interesting times that people are trying to kind of, you know, chop up and resegment the whole investment quicker. area. But, uh, back to that, I think the, the nature and the origin of the question, back to private venture capital, it, it's material from, from our perspective, the amount that we're investing in it. It obviously depends on the specifics, risk appetite of the client and the opportunity set, kind of what's going on out there. We're not just simply going to deploy to deploy, but I'll also uh, echo comments made difficult to do by the time the manager has, um, you know, a, a demonstrable track record that you would like to see, either they've grown bigger than what we would normally like to see given, you know, the market and where they might be able to generate outsized returns. Um, so I, I think that you have to be a little bit early, which requires even more diligence. So it's challenging to deploy the amount of capital that we ordinarily would want to do. Um, but it's definitely something that we're, we're consistently trying to achieve. So we, we're uh, active in the space. The other thing out there now is there's so much capital in private equity and venture right now uh, that every time, oh yeah, we're going to get above market returns. Oh, I, I always get 20%. Well, I want to see, you know, these funds as they come to uh, their end in, you know, four, seven, 10 years, whatever it is, and see how many of them are actually in 2020 particularly in venture capital right? and in venture because there's just so much capital out there and people are paying ridiculous prices uh and they're promising these returns but you know those returns are all mark to market and nobody's really marking them except the manager uh so yeah there, the, the there, was guy, point. there was a there was a guy named madoff who marked his <laughs> <laughs> well, always get twenty percent. Everybody got twenty percent. So let's just you know before you just say it's the only way to put only place I want to put my capital. You got to think about it a little bit. That's all. Personal I want to jump in here a little bit and and because we only have uh, I assume Marty about five ten minutes left. Maybe two. Oh Marty, Come two on. minutes. Well, Come even on. less. Then in that case, I want to fast forward this, this conversation a little bit to um, to some, you know, to to terms. Uh, you often hear that uh, you know I've got plain vanilla terms in my 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 summary and my PPM, uh, but you know it's always a negotiation. It's always a process. So where is the negotiation taking place these days? And Jim, I'm going to throw this out to you first, and then. Uh, Chip, hopefully you'll follow in. Uh, but what are things you want to see uh, when you get to the terms? When it comes time to the negotiation, what are you negotiating for? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. And it's constantly a moving target. Um, I mentioned alignment of interest up front. That's something very important and something that is a, a big hurdle for us, uh, that they're, they're putting sufficient capital in alongside all our investors, our LPs, uh, at the same terms. Uh, but we're also looking for other prudent things um, uh, clawback provision, key mans, stuff like that. Usually those aren't, uh, those, are, those are typically in there, but if they're not, that's going to be a red flag and we're certainly going to look for something. Representation on the uh, LPAC potentially, um, uh, that there's, uh, you know, sufficient, um, you know, vesting schedule on the, um, on the, on the, um, on the, the performance return on the, uh, you know, on, on, on that, on the incentive. Um, and that um, often for our clients that we have um, co-investment rights um, that to, to come alongside of that at, at favorable terms, usually with no management fee or very low, uh, to, again, to alignment of interest and things like that. So that's usually uh, the last thing I would add to that maybe on um, you know, investment minimums, uh, you know, mentioned earlier, dipping your toe in and things like that. So if it was a $10 million upfront commitment for a check, can we lower that, you know, uh, as we get comfortable with the manager? So that's that's usually where the terms are uh, are negotiated. Fantastic, Chip. Well, again, speaking more about hedge funds than than private equity, um, two and twenty is something that uh, nobody really 
wants. Uh, and uh, it's pretty much dying on the vine. Uh, and I think it depends. And if you're an emerging manager, you've got to have uh, a uh, early investor fee base, which is usually like one and a quarter and 10 uh, for people who put in the initial capital. Um, we're not really seeing many people trying to be at two. Uh, it's usually one and a half, one and a quarter with the size uh, on the management fee. Uh, I try and encourage people either to have a hurdle um, or uh, a, an ability when they, as they perform better to charge more fee. Cause there isn't anybody in this room that if somebody's giving you 25%, uh, you're not going to say he's earned his 20%, right? Uh, but if he's giving you 3%, could you really get paid 20%? What the hell has he really done for you? Uh, so I think that there's new ways that people are pricing uh, and on a sliding scale, uh, which makes sense. Uh, so I, I just think the world's changed. It's not just the pandemic, it's fees, it's alignment, as you said, Jim, you know, do they have skin in the game? And if so, how much? I mean, my guy I talked about earlier, NRC, is probably 18% of his fund. Um, so he wants to do well, because he's got all his family's money. So. Uh, I just have, I have one question. Do you guys see any differences in the way people raise money? I, and I just noticed in the venture capital community, like. In New York, it's a very staid, almost Wall Street approach, whereas in California, it's really a bunch of cowboys who will raise like on every year. Co-investments are like 7x per fund, uh, whereas co-investment in New York is about 1x. I mean, I mean, do you guys notice that craziness? Like, that, that maybe such a strange approach towards capital raising? And does that set up any bells or red lights for you guys when you see that people, you know, have these? Radically different approaches towards raising capital. Well, you know, I, I do it our way, um, and I don't really uh, pay a lot of attention to how others do it. I mean, the guys that I compete with pretty much do it like I do, um, which is you know kind of tried and true. We make calls, send the emails, send letters if it's appropriate. I'm not talking about the methodology. Yeah. I'm just talking about so, the yeah that they that they're in market every year. Versus well, New York, so to speak. they do, you know, the, the year before, you know, it's, it's kind of if they're crushing it, uh, you know, people are in market a lot. I think they're momentum racers. I mean, yeah, know. you know, so uh, I we've seen the gamut, and I think it's a sign of the times more than a, than a red flag. But you know, some of the things I talked about on what's important to us on the on the uh, terms negotiation, we feel align us with long term commitment, right? They're more investor friendly. We're in it for the long game and so are they. So to your point on someone who's just momentum raising, if they're not at all interested, and that's demand aside because I realize that they think that they can raise it. If they're not at all interested in setting up what we think is a prudent approach for our clients to continue to invest alongside of them through time, we're probably not interested in, in being partners with them. So uh, we take a more strategic approach and, and we'll stay away from those who I'd use that term again, hot money, right? If we see signs that maybe someone's just taking advantage of what's going out there and being cowboys, we're going to probably stay away. Do you think that some strategies are just too, like, too big to ignore, even though they're very new? And I'll give you like five new. Like, and let's start with crypto, right? So there was crypto in 2014, 2013. And then we have all this, uh, you know, what I call deep tech. We've got AI, we've got space, we've got robotics, you've got, you know, material science, things like that. And, and those are going to be vast, right? Space would be a vast area of venture capital investing and, you know, private equity and the public, right? I, I mean, you know it's going to be big, but at the same time, you don't want to be first. Right. In. Yeah, we're, we're taking more of a, a nuanced approach, more dip the toe, looking at, you know, the metaverse and all the different ways, all the stuff that you there mentioned you know, there. There's right. lots of things that we definitely cannot afford to ignore, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to take all, all players and that there are certainly going to be winners and losers, and it's not necessarily first movers that are going to determine who, who takes the cake. If so. you gone to virtual reality 10 years ago, it probably wasn't a good move. But, you know, you also, you have to have a bit of an education in each of these areas. 
because if you just throw your money at the five that Marty mentioned, plus you know six more we could all think of, uh, you don't know who's the player because it's all so new. So if you don't either have the understanding or a person you trust, whether it's a consultant or a friend or whatever that has an understanding of it, you got to be careful. Got to be careful. There's going to be losers in all of these areas. 